Hello everyone, and welcome back to Chess Openings Explained. Of course, this is the class where I look at chess openings and then explain them. Uh, today I am continuing the series on the Nidorf, and we are going to look at what uh, sort of has the reputation as being the most difficult, the most theory-heavy line. And hopefully by the end of the class, we will see that while there are a lot of moves, uh, they are kind of linear. So it doesn't take as much study, as much uh, theory-heavy learning uh, as you might expect. Of course, I'm talking about the bishop g5 line in the Nidorf. For a long time, this has been the most respected try against the Nidorf. This is sort of what the top players are saying. Yeah, this is it. If we're going to beat the Nidorf, we can rely on bishop g5 to create some complications. So I wanted to start off with uh, a game between Sergei Karyakin and Maxime vichir le And this is nowadays, I think, the uh, main line for these top level players. Of course, MVL is perhaps the best Nidorf player of all time, and he has very much pioneered this line against bishop g5. So let's take a look at it. Uh, the game starts with e4, c5, knight f3, d6, d4, takes, takes, knight f6, knight c3, a6, entering, of course, the Nidorf. Then we have this move, bishop g5. So this is the move I'm talking about. This denotes the bishop g5 line. Uh, of course, you know, with the move bishop g5, that makes sense. And this is what people have historically really struggled with in the Nidorf. Now, rather than the typical Nidorf e5, it actually makes a bit more sense to play the move e6 here. And part of the reason for that is this bishop is very well placed to target the knight on f6 to pin it back to the queen. And so if you make a move like e5, already the d5 square is going to be very, very weak. And that is going to cause black some pretty significant issues right away. So e6 is a bit better to keep control of the d5 square. Uh, then the line that we are specifically focusing on today is the next move, 7f4. There are other options for white, for example, queen f3, queen d2, queen d3, bishop e2, queen e2. Various other developing moves like this are available, and we will look at those eventually. But the real stuff all comes after the move f4. And now there are a variety of ways that black can play in response to this, just to name a few. Queen b6, for a long time, was the most popular. This is the uh, typical poisoned pawn variation, but it's actually not what I'm going to recommend here today. Uh, we also have the move bishop e7 by black. We have the move knight bd7, queen c7, and also, not bishop e7, but queen c7, also this move h6. And what h6 is, is uh, an attempt to improve upon the typical poisoned pawn variation with queen b6. And this is sort of the variation that Maxime vichir le has pioneered, and it's what he played here against uh, Sergei Karyakin. Uh, after this, the move bishop h4 should be played. And bishop takes f6 is very technically a legal move, but after queen takes f6, black sort of has no problems. And I'll get into that in a little bit more depth uh, a little bit later in the lecture. But for now, we'll focus on bishop h4. And now queen b6 is the idea. And it gets the name the poisoned pawn variation because black is targeting this b2 pawn and, in fact, looking to capture this pawn. Uh, in the meantime, white is going to try and use this time that black spends to capture on b2 to prove that this pawn was a little bit poisoned, that this queen is out of place because it snacked on the poisoned pawn on b2. And white's going to try to make something uh, out of that extra time that he has in the opening. Uh, with that in mind, there are really two main moves here, and then a few other sidelines that we will also get to as well. Uh, the move a3 is an attempt to keep the b2 pawn. After a3, black really shouldn't be capturing this guy. And then the move queen d2 is sort of the, the variation where black does go in and capture on b2. Uh, these days, I think a3 is sort of what's seen as... Uh, white's best chance at creating some play in the poison pawn. The lines after queen d2 have sort of been analyzed almost to death, and most of them, uh, in fact, all of them, if black plays correctly, I believe, do end up being uh, at least equality for black. So why can't you take this pawn after a3? Well, if you do end up capturing, of course, knight a4 is the typical trap. Uh, the pawn on a3 guards the last square on b4, and indirectly the square on a3 by allowing the rook to look at it. So this pawn is now uncapturable. 
And that's what Sergei Karyakin chose in this game, uh, by the way, from the 2017 London Chess Classic. A3 to guard the b4 square, defending the b2 pawn. Uh, now we have the move bishop e7 by black, and this is sort of the reason why we displaced this bishop and put it back on h4. Uh, now, after the move bishop e7, we are actually sort of creating threats of capturing on the e4 pawn. We have dislocated this bishop from the g5 square, where it's defended, to h4, where it would actually be hanging with check in many lines. And this is the reason why MVL decides to include this move h6. It's to put this bishop on h4 rather than g5. And we'll see that come into play in a lot of other variations as well. Uh, but for now, because this bishop is undefended, it would, wants to reroute itself back to f2, notably challenging the queen on b6. And now, with its dreams of taking on b2 sort of vanquished, the queen has to retreat back to c7. And what was the point of this whole maneuver? Well, with a3 and with bishop h4 to f2, white has wasted a little bit of time, and black has alleviated a lot of the pressure on this diagonal and gotten his pieces developed pretty adequately. Uh, from here, there's really only one setup that really makes sense for white in this position. It doesn't make so much sense to go for kingside castling in these kinds of structures. Black is just too well set up for it with the versatile pawn center and plans of b5 coming very, very quickly. So white should play queen f3 and look to queenside castle. And this is what I mean when I say that the theory uh, is pretty long, but it's pretty linear, right? White only really has this one serious plan, at least in this a3 variation, uh, of castling queenside and then going for an attack on the king's side. So we can go pretty far with our analysis, but we don't have to go too wide, uh, so to speak. Uh, now black is happy to develop with knight b to d7, just getting all the pieces into the game, and white's going to go ahead and queenside castle. Uh, now, rather than castle kingside, this is one of those variations where it makes a bit more sense for black to keep the king in the center. Uh, the king is just going to be a little bit more safe there, a little bit more solid, and we'll see that white's plan very quickly involves pushing all of these guys forward and trying to open up the kingside. Definitely don't want our king over there uh, for that. It also has the nice bonus of not spending time on castles, so we can spend all of our tempi by pushing on the queen's side and making immediate counterplay. Uh, up next, uh, we see white pick the move g4. Once again, this is sort of really the only serious move by white here. You can try something else like bishop d3 or king b1, but you're going to play g4 eventually, and it should more or less uh, transpose. And after g4, I'd like you guys in the chat room to stop and think and see if you can come up with uh, what Black's idea should be in this particular position. Uh, just come up with some ideas in general. Uh, we're not yet really out of the theory. You can go a bit deeper because, like I said, the play is sort of so linear, just following one direct variation. Uh, but I'd like to stop here just to talk about some of the ideas that Black is going to have. So what do you guys think? So yeah, there's a lot of good ideas. So in the long term, definitely playing something like b4 is going to be on Black's mind. But we'll see that this is actually uh, not the best way of playing in this particular uh, position, at least immediately. It makes a lot more sense whenever you see this pawn step to f4 to very seriously consider targeting the pawn on e4. So in this case, the line I'm going to recommend is the main move here, which is bishop b7. And we'll see that black's play very often revolves around making this pawn uh, look like a, a pretty serious weakness. And because of that, and because of Black's second idea, which you guys in the chat have also found, White now has to make a very serious decision. So if Bishop G2, this is an attempt to over-defend the uh, E pawn, it makes moves like Knight C5 slightly less effective, because Queen E2 is now comfortably defending everything. Uh, then Black has this second idea in the position. So as you guys in the chat were mentioning, we would love to have the e5 square for our knight, and after bishop g2, we can achieve just that by playing this move g5. And this is definitely the way to go. 
Uh, now, White uh, has to make a decision here of how he's going to deal with this threat to the F pawn uh, most often. And in this particular game, we do see the move H4 come on the board. And from here, Black can take on F4 and jump this knight into, uh, into E5. Uh, someone's mentioning there's a trick if the queen takes on f4. It's not a very tricky trick. You just attack two pieces at once, and then they can't really be saved. So white shouldn't recapture. Instead, the move g5 is common. And we'll get into what happens in this variation in our main game here between Karyakin and MVL. But I wanted to highlight what happens if white decides to focus on this g5 idea instead uh, and plays this move h4. And so, of course, now, by giving attention to the g5 idea and sort of ignoring the threat to the e-pawn, black now switches ideas, no longer goes for g5, and instead focuses on the e-pawn. And this is sort of the way that black is always getting a good position from uh, this line in the opening. He has these two pretty major threats that white should try to stop, and white can really only stop one of them. Uh, so after h4, of course, I like the move knight c5, very directly, very seriously challenging this uh, e-pawn. White can go bishop d3. We'll see knight takes d3 in many cases. Rook takes d3 and d5. And now e5 and knight e4. And this is the point of black's play. He gangs up on the e4 square with all of his pieces, pushes d5 to liberate his pieces, and plants this knight on e4. And now there is a game here also by Maxime Vichier Legrave against Vichy Anand. And that game continued bishop e1, queenside castles. Uh, white tried g5, which looks a little blunt, but sort of needed to be done. We actually don't see rook takes h1, sorry, queen b6, knight c e2. And I'm blowing through these moves pretty quickly, but black's play uh, is, is sort of solid here. Uh, for example, queen g2, and then g6 is the move I'm going to stop. Uh, I'm going to stop on here. G6, of course, clamps down white's ideas on the king's side. And black just has a very, very safe, very solid position. And there are a ton of different ideas that black can go for here. Of course, a5 and b4 is definitely on the cards. This knight on e4 is super solid. It's never really going to be removed from this square. Notably, if it gets challenged by another knight, black is generally happy to recapture on e4 with the pawn opening up the d-file for the rook and this bishop a bit more. And black's position is, is just going to be perfectly fine here, uh, as it was in Vichyanant against MVL. So like I said, sort of these two ideas from the opening here. One is to challenge e4, and two is to go for g5. So in the main game we're looking at between Karyakin and Maxime Vichyarlegrave, we have bishop g2. So focusing on the e4 idea, so instead we push g5 to challenge f4. Uh, white does have another option here of pushing f5 instead of pushing for h4. And here I think e5 is perfectly fine for black. Uh, for example now, if knight back to b3, we can uh, play it, plant this rook onto c8, creating some threats of knight takes e4, for example. Uh, immediately, that is a threat, just to show. Can't recapture with the knight because of checkmate. Can't recapture with the queen because it's defended. So queen e2 should be played. And then from here, h5 is a very important move uh, that totally locks down white's queenside play. Now white is not going to be able to push h4 because there's so much pressure to the g4 pawn. So this is sort of our, our first real branch, right? We have this decision to stop g5 or stop knight c5. And then we have this decision to play f5 or h4. But in either line, we see uh, black's play is actually going to be pretty similar. The difference here, of course, is that the black king is going to stay in the center. But from here, of course, black's play is going to be pretty similar to the other lines, pushing a5, pushing b4, and attacking on the queen side. When, in the meantime, it's really not clear how you're going to be able to open things up on the king's side for white, with these pawns sort of locked together. Uh, OK, but the main move here is h4, uh, prompting uh, g takes f4, and then g5 by Sergei Karyakin. So, in this line, of course, white is sort of successfully crashing through on the king's side uh, as compared to the other line that we saw with f5, which is why this one, I think, is a bit more popular. Uh, after g5, it's good for black to insert this intermezzo with knight to e5. Now, of course, the, the threat of pawn to e5 has been eliminated, so white can capture on f4. 
Uh, and now black sort of has various options here. Black can just play knight up to d7 directly. Black can actually play the move knight h5, although it looks a little bit funny out there. But in the game, I think MVL chose the simplest. He simply takes on g5, takes on g5, and eliminates one of the rooks with rook takes h1, rook takes h1, and then drops this other knight back to d7. And I would say you can kind of comfortably uh, say that the opening is sort of over and done with after the next two moves. Uh, King b1 was played, and queenside castles. And now we are firmly in a middle game position here with MVL uh, sort of surviving the opening without any trace of difficulty. Uh, now, of course, if this check were to be given, rook h8, this might look tempting at first, but black is actually pretty happy to play the move knight f8, and all of a sudden you've just kind of walked into uh, some unnecessary threats. They're working back to h6, but now black is very much in time to counterattack on the queen side with moves like b4, moves like queen c4 to come, and uh, yeah, just counterattacking over here. Meanwhile, knight gf6 definitely on the cards for black as well, rerouting the pieces into the game. Uh, of course, there are other options here for white besides just the check and king b1, but black's play is going to be pretty similar, I think, against all of them. Eventually, looking to queenside castle, looking to play b4, and in this game, we'll see looking to improve the pieces in some ways that you might not expect. That's why I want to show this whole game here because MVL really introduces some stellar middle game ideas that are going to help you uh, gain a, a slightly deeper understanding of the Nidorf. In the game, of course, we did have king b1 and queenside castles. Uh, now, uh, Karyakin chooses the move rook to h3, uh, adding perhaps a little bit of extra defense to some of these weak squares on the third rank. Also, uh, yeah, I guess that's the main idea. Also, in some worlds, you might need to double up with something like queen h2, but we're always away from that for now. Uh, in the game, uh, MVL is very, very patient. He, he takes his time here. He realizes that while everything does look slightly loose in this position, he actually doesn't have anything to worry about. And so he just plays the move king, G, king to b8. Uh, and now I do want to mention here, uh, sorry, I, I skipped over it first, but there is one very, very testing move for white that uh, Karyakin was likely thinking about in the game, and uh, I, I actually remembered this game from 2017, believe it or not. I watched this tournament live, and to my recollection, this move was a bit of a, a hot topic while the game was going on. So what move do you think Karyakin was considering here that would have been very testing for MVL to, uh, to face? What move for white? could have been tried here. What do you think? Yeah, of course, another idea with Rook H3 is to hop over to G3. And perhaps that hints at what the idea was here. And yeah. Uh, somebody in the chat does have it, g6 would have been a very testing move. And here black is actually totally busted, if not for the move, rook to g8. Uh, this is sort of the only way for black to play now. And the reason for that is you can't really get away with taking this pawn in either manner because of the weakness to e6. Uh, if you take with this guy, of course, knight takes e6 is just devastating. But the move rook g8 is going to be good enough for black to save this game. Uh, now, for example, g takes f7 is met with rook takes g2. Rook h8 check would mean, uh, sorry, not the king anywhere because it's illegal, but knight f8. And now after knight takes e6, queen c4, and knight takes f8, for example, regaining the piece, but there is queen f1 check. And after king a2, you might actually lose the game from rook takes f2, but knight d1 is good enough for white, takes on d1, king a2, takes on c2, queen f5 check, king b8, knight, b, knight g6 check, king c7, f8 queen, and everybody loves a good old fashioned perpetual check. Everybody loves perpetual check, right? Don't go there, by the way, because then you get met with bishop takes, and that could be bad for you. But perpetual check is going to be good enough in this case. Now, does that mean you have to memorize this line? 
No, you can sort of intuitively find these moves. The only hard move I think to find is queen c4. Uh, after that, it's just checking the king and making sure you know he can't escape, which is not too bad. But yeah, g6 would have been a really interesting try for white here. But I will say, I do think this is sort of no longer a theoretical po position. We're definitely uh, running out of theory here. If black wished to avoid this line altogether, you could consider playing knight f8 in the uh, position before castles, just to stop g6 altogether before you castle. But g6 is just quite simply a, a forced draw. And I don't know if it's fair to say that white is on the better side of the draw. He does get two queens, but he does have to be very, very careful about his, his king position. So g6, definitely an interesting line in this case. Instead, we saw the move rook h3 and king b8. Now, uh, white sort of has a more difficult time regrouping these pieces than black does. In the game, Sergei chose the move bishop to e3, and uh, of course, this is aimed at adding a little bit of defense to the g5 pawn, also perhaps hinting that the bishop could come to f4 at a later stage. And MVL simply plays the move rook g8. No, no reason to let this g6 idea stand for longer than it needs to. I should mention if g6 here, now the move knight takes g6 is going to be playable. Uh, although maybe actually, yeah, is knight g6 the right idea? I kind of forgot about this line. Uh, OK, so yeah, knight g6, queen f7. You can bring this knight to e5. Now after queen e6, this is no longer check, so the line is a bit better. And MVL still has some tactical ideas here. Of course, we did not have to allow this again. Could have played rook g8 on this move. Maybe that would have been much, much simpler instead of king b8. But MVL had it all figured out with king b8, followed by rook g8. Uh, now rook g3 comes on the board, trying to force this idea through. But after rook g7, the idea of g6 sort of dies. The reason being now, whenever you play this, knight takes g6, and my f pawn is defended. Uh, so rook g7, and this is the first sort of interesting repositioning of the pieces that I found in MVL's game. He brings the rook over to the g file, brings it up to g7, and after that, white's only active idea is sort of shut down. Uh, now that MVL has shut down white's only active idea of playing g6, he can pretty freely go about improving his pieces here. So the move bishop h3 came on the board, and here uh, MVL actually brings the rook over to h7. Uh, it does the same job of defending f7 and stopping g6, but it's a little bit more active over here. Now we have queen f2 by white. We could have seen this move coming. It frees up the f4 square for the bishop and allows uh, the queen some mobility. Uh, and now the move knight c5 is pretty intuitive to bring the knight to the active c5 square and pressure uh, e4. Some people in the chat were mentioning some ideas of knight a4 to challenge the knight on c3. And that is definitely true, although I don't think it makes as much sense here as we don't have that sort of lethal pressure down the c file. That's when knight a4 is a good idea. When you have this pressure, on the c file, and you really just want to evict this knight. In this case, though, we're happy on c5, challenging e4. Uh, the bishop drops back to g2 to parry this threat. And now I sort of want to ask you what to do with this bishop. Uh, what interesting idea does Maxime have here to improve the positioning of this bishop? What can you do to make your pieces even better? Uh, someone is saying it belongs on g7, so f8 to g7 is definitely an idea. So what um, Maxime does is actually a pretty typical idea in the Nidorf. It turns out maybe this bishop would be decent on the g7 square. I don't know. Uh, I don't know if it's my favorite, actually, and I think there are some uh, problems with going bishop f8, in particular this problem. But if we could, in some magic world, get it to g7, I think it would be pretty good. I don't know if it's actually going to be realistic, though. Maybe you can try knight g6 first, something like knight d2, bishop f8, and, and get here this way. But it, it does take some time, and it is allowing white some pressure on uh, of, of playing the move g6. Uh, but yeah, that's not a bad idea at all. It's actually a really interesting idea that you guys are mentioning here. And maybe it's 
maybe it's worth a try in some games. But the idea that Maxime uses is actually a bit more common in the Nidorf. It's going queen c8. Now, how does queen c8 improve this bishop? Well, of course, our idea is to not go bishop f8, but rather go bishop d8 and activate the bishop along the d8 to a5 diagonal. And yeah, this shows up all the time in other lines in the Nidorf. But MVL shows that it can be a very, very good idea here as well. So queen c8 was his move. Uh, Sergei drops this bishop back to c1. And now we do actually see bishop d8, knight f3, knight g6, sort of stepping out of the trade of knights. Uh, this knight comes back to d4. We see one repetition. And then after knight back to d4, MVL does play the move bishop b6, deciding to continue the game rather than accept a repetition. And for very good reason here. Uh, he has found ways to improve his pieces. In the meantime, white's pieces are, are sort of as improved as they can get. Two pieces passively defending e4, this bishop passively defending g5, and the, king's, or in the queen side, I guess. And this knight with some active play, but not really achieving a whole lot against Black's solid setup here. And because of that, Black has a ton of freedom in this position to sort of play however he wants, which is exactly what MVL does. Uh, Sergei brings the bishop back to e3, and uh, MVL brings the knight back to e5. Now, if uh, Sergei were to try the same repetition, we would definitely step into c4 rather than back to g6, putting pressure on the bishop. So he goes b3 instead to try and contest this square. Although this does create some long-term weaknesses on the queen side for uh, white. And now, after rook h4, the pressure on the e pawn is definitely mounting. We have knight d to e2, queen up to c7, bishop d4, knight c d7. Once again, playing very slowly. White's threatening to fracture our pawns, so knight c d7 is fine. He doesn't mind trading off some pieces. And in the long run, these two pawns are going to be very, very weak for white, and that's sort of the story of the game. Uh, MVL does end up winning thanks to the weakness made by having these two pawns. Knight d4 played in the game, knight g6, and I'm going to speed up a bit now because we're sort of well past the middle game. King d2, this knight comes to f4. King e3, takes, check, takes, check. King d2, knight e5, knight d e2, check. King c1, knight h4. And some maneuvering. The king comes into the game towards the f pawn. Knight e5 again. We see some passing, some fumbling around. And a trade of the knights, and the g pawn falls. This is sort of the first one to go. And then after d5, uh, Sergei Karyakin actually just resigns in this position rather than play out this end game. Uh, with the g pawn gone, black is going to get two connected pass pawns uh, uncontested. And that is going to be the story of the game. And, and that's how this game ended. Sergei resigning, perhaps a bit early, but in a technically lost endgame. And the story of this game very much was once MVL was able to stop this idea of G6, Sergei was left with very little uh, in the way of active ideas of ways to improve his pieces. And meanwhile, the play for black was very, very natural. You bring the bishop to a better diagonal, you bring the knights to good squares, and then and the position sort of plays itself with some pressure on the queen side as well. So any questions on this game? This is, like I said, probably the most common line uh, against the uh, Nidorf in the bishop g5 variation. Uh, this move 9a3 to keep the b pawn and sort of go for this king side attack, I think is very, very common these days. So any questions on this before we move on to some other stuff? OK, what if g6 instead of bishop h3, it looks good? Mm -mm. All right, well, let's take a look. Backing all the way up to bishop h3. g6 here, uh, we can just take, and we are defending f7, right? I, I did mention this briefly. Uh, if you want to take this guy, rook takes g6. There is actually an annoying knight e5 here. This check doesn't do anything, just queen d8. And yeah, I don't know, black's, black's up a lot of pieces. Uh, I guess not a lot of pieces, but black's pieces are very active, and winning an f-pawn wasn't really worth it for you. 
Uh, all right, well, with that, let us move on to the next variation. So now I'm going to hop into a line where white actually allows you to capture that B2 pawn. This is uh, some very fighting stuff, and this is where the theory does get a bit heavier than in the line with A3. I know we went really deep with the theory on move 15, 16, 17, but it was very linear, whereas here white does have a few different pretty serious options to look at. So to start off with, I want to show you guys a game between uh, Francisco Vallejo Ponce and Alexander Morozovich. Uh, and this game goes, of course, the opening moves of the Nidorf. Don't need to spend too much time. Uh, a6, bishop g5, e6, f4 is what we're looking at. Uh, h6 for the delayed poison pawn, bishop h4, queen b6, queen d2. And this is the move that allows you to capture on b2. So let's take a look. Queen takes b2. Uh, and now there is sort of a sideline that I want to mention here. Of course, the main move by far is the very, very natural rook b1. If white tries the move knight b3, then we can actually again make use of the fact that this bishop is on an undefended square with the move bishop e7. Now, if rook b1, this is sort of a horrible blunder because knight takes e4, challenges the queen and the knight and the bishop. So you can't go rook, uh, rook b1. And here, bishop f6 is actually the best that white can do to not end up any worse. If you go a4, trying to trap the queen in a different manner, then once again, knight takes e4 is just too good for black. So bishop f6, bishop f6. And from here, you can play the move knight a4, uh, hitting the queen, stepping out of the threat of the bishop. Queen a3 should be played. And now the only line to not be significantly worse for white, well, I guess not to be losing for white, is to play knight b6, bishop takes, uh, knight takes a1, queen c5, knight a8. And here what black can simply play the move b6 and recapture this knight uh, fairly easily with either queen c6 or bishop b7 to follow. For example, knight b3, queen c6, knight b6, queen b6, and black is doing just fine here. So just a little sideline I wanted to mention. Uh, in general, thanks to the misplacement of this bishop, bishop e7 is usually a really good response to most of, black's, most of white's threats against this black queen early on on the queen's side, just to, remind, just to remember. Uh, rook b1, though, is the actual move. Now queen a3 should, should be played. And here I'm going to look at three different options for white, three different branches. Uh, number one is the move f5, which I'm going to take a look at first. Number two is the move e5, which is actually the more common. And number three, I'm going to see what happens if white actually decides to take this knight on f6. So number one, the move f5 looks pretty challenging, right? Uh, similar to the Sozin attack, uh, white is going to be ready to bring the bishop out to c4 and challenge the light squares in the black camp. But no need to fear for black. Thanks to this bishop, once again, we can play the move bishop e7. And we are actually now developing with tempo with ideas of taking on e4. Uh, white must take on e6 to not be worse. f takes e6, bishop c4. Uh, we don't take with the bishop in this case because we need the bishop back on c8 to defend the e6 pawn from these attacks. Now, black, white has actually allowed our big tactic. This is why we put the bishop on h4, so that we have this knight takes e4 tactic. And when white allows it, we should generally, generally play it. Uh, knight takes e4, bishop takes h4, comes with check. And after g3, we get into what is sort of the most theory-heavy stuff here. Uh, already, we're 15 moves deep, but the theory does actually keep going. So just quick refresher on how we got here. Queen a3 after rook b1 is very, very standard. F5 is sort of the decision point for white. We develop our piece with a threat to e4, takes on e6, takes bishop c4, and now takes on e4. That's where we're at. Uh, so knight takes e4 is forced, bishop takes, g3 is forced, and now bishop g5 is the idea for black. Uh, the point being, we really do need to start eliminating some of these attacking pieces around our king, or else we could get into serious trouble. Notably, if knight takes d6 here, okay, sorry, I forgot, the queen just defends it. Um, so, uh, white is more or less forced to capture on g5, or again, he's going to be significantly worse after something like d5. So, 
knight takes g5 is forced. We have h takes g5 now. And the deep point for black is that we have a tactic. Everybody loves a good old-fashioned tactic. So knight takes e6 is the way to continue for white. Otherwise, uh, sorry, yeah. So knight takes e6 it would normally be the way to continue for white. These days, castles is actually a bit more common because of the tactic I just highlighted. So knight e6, bishop e6, bishop e6. And now let's see if you guys can find uh, the full sequence here. What is the full tactic? I gave you a, a very strong hint with my arrows, but what is the full line here for black to equalize? What's the idea for black? Nobody has it. Nobody has it. Uh, so yeah, queen takes g3, and the idea is not to win all of the rooks, but to win back one of the rooks with h takes g3, rook takes h1, king e2, and now rook takes b1 would be asking to get checkmated, but we do actually have rook h2 check here, with the point being we get to take the queen back as well. And the fact of the matter is, this is just a slightly better endgame for black. Uh, everything is pretty much symmetrical, but he ends up with an extra G pawn, which, of course, not the most useful thing in the world, but not bad to have either. Uh, black should try to defend this pawn momentarily with move rook a7. After bishop d5, though, it does make sense just to develop and give this pawn back. If you try something like b5, you're going to get met with a4, and this is going to be tough uh, for you to keep this pawn uh, anyways. So knight d7, for example. Uh, and, sorry, yeah, knight d7, rook b7, rook b7, bishop b7, knight c5, bishop b3, king d7. Uh, and the game was agreed to a draw here between Vallejo Ponce and Morozovic. Uh, so backing up a little bit, we very quickly got from opening theory to the end of the game, which does happen sometimes. Uh, but in this position, I was saying knight e6 does seem like the logical move, but thanks to this very clever tactic with queen g3 and rook h1, uh, black is doing just fine here. So these days, castles is going to be a bit more common, I think. And here, uh, the only move for black is to play the move queen c5. You need to pin this knight to the king, make sure it's not going to come kill you. And now, with threats to the knight and the bishop, uh, white should play the move uh, queen to f2 and the point now for black is not to actually capture this piece when of course you would like die you don't want to die here dying is bad but instead you get to play the move knight c6 and the point is you want to capture this piece with check you are threatening this guy and from here the only move for white to not kind of lose the game is going to be the move not queen f7 which would lose a piece no way to save the piece here. Takes, takes, takes with check. Rook f2. And yeah, actually probably you, you don't take this guy. Now you, you can just take this guy. Queen takes. Maybe you don't want to take that guy. Maybe you just play b5 here and develop your pieces. And now I guess black is not up a piece, but he is up three pawns and not immediately checkmated, he is just going to be winning this position. So two really critical ideas for black, queen c5, queen f2, knight c6. Have to know those two in this line. Uh, from here, like I said, the only line for white is actually to take on e6. Now we have takes, 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 takes. And here we get a similar looking endgame with one extra set of rooks on the board. Uh, the difference here, of course, is with the extra rook, the black king being a little bit uh, waylaid matters a bit more, but black gets to keep this pawn for just a few moments longer. So bishop d5 is the main move, knight e5, bishop takes b7, king e7. And here there's actually a game, uh, a few games, and uh, Maxime Vichir Legrave has had this position two times, and he has drawn it quite easily both times. Uh, from this position. Uh, it's a pretty easy endgame with this knight being so strongly placed on the central square of e5, uh, indirectly sort of pressuring the king side, keeping the c pawn at bay, 
and black should have absolutely no difficulties in this endgame at all. And those are pretty much the two most theory-heavy variations in the Night Orf. So let's go over it one more time. We had queen d2, allowing you to take the poisoned pawn, queen b1, sorry, rook b1, queen a3, f5, challenging the e6 pawn, bishop e7, takes takes, bishop c4. He allowed our tactics, so we played it, check, bishop back to g5, knight takes g5 is forced, hg5, and now knight e6 allows our big tactic here, of queen takes g3, and kingside castles means queen c5, pitting the knight, queen f2 means knight c6, uh, attacking the knight again. Which I know seems like a lot, but, you know, it's the knight orf. What are you going to do? Sometimes you got to know stuff, right? And that's, that's why the bishop g5 variations do have this reputation for being th very theory heavy. That being said, while it is kind of a lot, it took 15 minutes to go through all of this part. And so hopefully it's not too much for you guys to, to remember if you do end up deciding to play the knight orf yourselves. With that in mind, let's move on to uh, another game and another idea. We went over the idea of f5, and let's take a look now at the main move of e5. And to do so, we are going back again, once again, to Maxime vichier le Graf with the black pieces. He, like I said, really championed this variation and is the main proponent of it at the top level. Uh, this was a game he had against Anish Giri that went with all of these same knight orf opening moves, e4, c5, a6, bishop g5, uh, e6, f4, and queen b6. So in this case, uh, MVL did not actually do the delayed poison pawn, just played queen b6 immediately, but we'll see he does transpose quite quickly. Queen d2 is played, takes rook b1, queen a3, and after e5, h6, bishop h4, we are at our main position here. So you can easily imagine for example, this position could have gotten here by this move order instead, right? Queen a3, e5. And like I said, this is one of the main ideas for white in this position, playing e5 here. Um, so let me dock back over to the actual game. And so here we are. So how should you respond to this with uh, black? Well, of course, it makes sense to actually capture this pawn on e5 with the d-pawn. The reason for that is it gives uh, your queen and your bishop access to this long diagonal. And for two, it actually does weaken this e5 pawn pretty considerably. So de5, fe5 should be played always. And now there are a few different um, ideas here for black. You can try the move g5, which is actually the most common, but I actually liked this line the least when I was uh, preparing for this lecture. Uh, it just seems needlessly complicated and not very good for black if, if anything goes wrong, whereas I think the other two moves are going to be a, a bit of a better try for black. So uh, in uh, Alex Kulovich's chessable series, I have been using that sort of as a reference for some of these lines, seeing what he suggests. He actually suggests the move knight d5 here. And this line felt a little bit fishy. Um, I, I'm sure it's actually fine for black if you play very, very well. But believe it or not, I did actually try playing some games in the Night Orf before giving all these lectures. And uh, whenever I played knight d5, I just was not, I was not so happy with my position. So looking at it, I do think I really like the third option here, the best for black, which is to play the move knight fd7. And this is asking for some pretty serious complications. Uh, the reason for that is you are very directly attacking this e5 pawn, and it is very much in white's best interest to allow you to take it. If he tries to defend it, for example, he's asking for the move bishop b4 when things are getting very, very awkward for white along this diagonal. No clear way uh, for how to break free. And in the meantime, this is still going to be a big weakness. So knight e4 should definitely be played for white. This is sort of the only move, defending b4 with two pieces. And now, uh, being very, very greedy, we are going to take even more pawns with queen takes a2. Just give me all of the pawns. Now rook d1 should be played for white to step out of the attack uh, to the rook, keeping an eye on the first rank. Uh, and queen d5 makes sense now for... Uh, for black, uh, forking the knight and the pawn. Q 
queen e3 is an attempt to defend everything. But after queen takes e5, we've taken one, two, three extra pawns uh, for our troubles. So of course, white is going to need something pretty extreme to make up for a three pawn deficit. And we'll see that he is actually able to, to get enough compensation for the three pawns. Uh, the way to achieve this is with the move bishop e2, just naturally developing. And now it's not the time to dilly-dally with black. We need to develop as quickly as possible. So bishop c5, uh, pressuring the center. Bishop g3, queen d5 is one choice. Bishop takes d4 is another choice. Really, they both have the same idea of eventually playing bishop takes d4. The only difference is after queen d5, you provoke this pawn out to the c4 square. Um, and so queen d5 was MVL's choice in this game. It really changes the variations so, so, so very little. And I don't think it's going to be too much of a relevant difference. So queen d5 in this game. Uh, c4 was played by Anish Giri. We have bishop takes d4, rook takes d4, queen a5 check. Note, like I said, you can get here from this position as well. It's almost identical. Um, Queen a5 check, rook back to d2 to block the check. King side castles now for black. And then white's idea is finally made clear with the move bishop d6. And the point here is that it's very, very difficult for black to keep this rook on the board. Uh, this rook is going to more or less eventually have to kill itself off for this dark squared bishop one way or another. It's just kind of a question um, of how. The move that's the most common is actually rook d8, but I like MVL's move a bit better. But let's take a quick look at rook d8 just to show you that black really shouldn't be trying to keep this guy. White is very quickly going to play g4, trying to checkmate you. Knight c6, for example, kingside castles, knight d to e5. And after h4, already black should be capturing this bishop. If you don't, then g5 is going to come very, very quickly and you're going to run into some pretty major issues here. If you just try to develop nonchalantly, knight f6 check, and you are busted, my friend. Very, very busted. So rook takes d6 would eventually be played here anyways, and the point now is after something like knight takes, you go b6, g5, uh, g5, and you go queen c5, and try to trade off the queens. That's why you have to get rid of this bishop, so you have these ideas of trading off the queens. Uh, that being said, I don't recommend any of that. I'm just showing you what uh, is sort of the most common and why black can't actually keep all of this material to himself, uh, because he very much does want the trade of queens. So instead, MVL's move is f5, which I do like uh, better than the move rook d8, uh, partially because it's more forcing, and so there's less to know, because white is going to have to make uh, white's decisions are going to be, uh, white's going to have less decisions to, to make, which can be a bad thing because your opponent has less chances to go wrong if they only, you know, if they can only play forced moves, but it's also a good thing because you don't have to remember as much. So after f5, bishop takes f8 should be played. Now knight takes f8 is the obvious move. Knight d6 puts a lot of pressure on black's position, but he can just develop with the move knight b to d7. Uh, now there are two different options here for white, but uh, I do kind of think it's safe to say that we are very much out of the opening. Uh, once we play this move knight b d7, I am going to like uh, just call it once the queens are off the board. Until then, black still has some problems left to solve. But after knight bd7, uh, it is sort of just a middle game position. The only thing that's left to do for black, like I said, is to make sure that these queens end up getting traded off the board. Fortunately for black, it is not very difficult to ensure that that happens by force. So there are two options, like I said, for, uh, for white that are pretty serious. There's the move g4, which is generally met with f takes g4. There's a game that goes bishop takes g4, and then to get the queens off, MVL goes rook queen a1 check, rook d1, queen e5. So like I said, very, very direct, just force the queens off the board, and then black is totally, totally fine. So that's g4. I don't want to get too in-depth in into it. The point is, you take, off the you take off the queens, and then 
black is doing OK. Uh, another choice for white is actually the move bishop f3. And here, once again, queen a1 check is not a bad idea with queen e5 to follow. So I'm kind of counting those as the same thing. Um, now, white's other idea is sort of more natural, just to castle the king. And here, of course, queen e5 isn't ever pinning the, uh, pinning the queen to the king, but queen c5 is. And that's what we see get played in this game. And so after this move, black has sort of solved all of the opening problems by ensuring that the queens get off the board. Of course, black's pieces are still slightly awkwardly placed, but I definitely don't think it's, it's an opening task any longer. So if you are really trying to memorize everything, I think you can safely wash your hands of this variation by this move. Uh, once queens are off the board, it's, it's out of the opening, and black just needs to you know, play good chess. With all of that in mind, let's get a feel for how this endgame might go. We have the move queen d4, a5, g4. Uh, so uh, white goes queen d4 to try and bait black into capturing on d4, uh, sort of improving the rook, and then goes g4 to open up this, the position. In the meantime, MVL pushes a5, trying to make his passed pawn a little bit more relevant. Not a bad idea at all. You know, rather than move the rook to a developed square, why not just develop it by pushing this pawn forward? It's a, sort of a neat idea. And then now MVL actually chooses the strange looking uh, f4, which is definitely a pawn sacrifice that is a little bit mysterious to me, but I do think is perfectly fine. Perhaps simpler would be to play something like g6 and just try to keep everything safe and solid. Once again, black's king looks very, very weak, but with queens coming off the board sort of immediately, uh, there's not too much to be afraid of here for, uh, for black, uh, especially with these knights covering a lot of the weak squares in the black camp, along with this bishop. Uh, in the game, though, we do see f4. Rook takes f4. And now perhaps the simplest for black would have been to play the move e5. And now after something like bishop e6, all of his pieces would be developed. All of his pieces would be in the game, and I don't think there's any reason why he should be worse with two full pawns uh, for the exchange. In the game, though, he chose the move a4, pushing the pawn even further. Rook f1, queen takes d4 check, knight out to c5. And after a3, we do really feel the presence of this a pawn. Uh, white manages to win back one of the pawns, though. And now we get this endgame where White should actually be slightly better. Uh, thanks to the activity of his pieces, he's able to sort of uh, get that uh, material imbalance down from two pawns for the exchange to just one pawn for the exchange. But with that in mind, so few pieces left on the board. The white king is very, very exposed. Uh, black should have no uh, major issues in trying to draw this still, although it definitely didn't have to get to this point. Uh, again, I think that move e5 definitely would have been simpler for MBL. In the game, though, rook a2 was played, rook d8, rook takes a3, picking up the a pawn now. Like I said, this was uh, going to happen thanks to the activity of white's pieces, but now rook d2, and MVL has activity of his own. h3, knight back to f6, rook, f, uh, rook e3, king f7, rook f2, check, king over to e7, rook a3, knight e4, and more chess moves. And after rook takes g7, it all starts going downhill for Anish Giri very, very quickly. There's a check, a knight d4 move, and after king f2, knight d3 check, and white actually resigned in this position because this is attacked, and if king e3, knight f5 forks the remaining rook and king. And so MVL actually did go on to win this game. Of course, it was a rapid game, so by this point, the players were not playing their best. The emphasis was more on that opening and early middle game where we saw MVL solving his problems uh, by getting the queens off the board and then pushing that A pawn to develop his rook. Some very common ideas in this opening line. Uh, now I know that that was another sort of bear of a ton of theory, but most of the moves are uh, sort of intuitive, right? Let's go through them one by one, one more time. So we have our starting position, uh, F4. Now, once again, I'm recommending this move order, but it doesn't really matter in this particular game. e5, and that brings us here. d takes e5, f e5, knight d7, trying to pick up the pawn. Knight e4, we take on a2, hitting the rook on b1, and then go queen d5. 
after queen e3, we take on e5, just take all the stuff. Here, we need to develop very quickly, so bishop c5, bishop g3, our queen's attacked, so queen d5, or bishop takes d4 first. Uh, so queen d5 baiting c4, so c4 takes takes, queen out to a5 with check, rook d2, then we get castled, bishop d6, we don't care about our rook, we just push f5, takes on f8, takes on f8, knight d6, knight bd7, getting developed, and then from here, our last task is to get the queens off the board, which we should more or less always be able to force. For example, castles, queen c5, or g4, takes takes, queen e5. Uh, sorry, rather, queen a1 check first is good, and then queen e5. Queen e5 immediately, not a bad move either. So I know that's a lot to sort of take in. This is definitely uh, a lot of theory. But like I said, we're covering pretty much all of the crazy stuff here in this one hour lecture. If it can be taught in one hour, I trust you guys to be able to, to learn all of it. Um, with that in mind, I am going to open up to questions about this line uh, really quickly. And then I am going to, with my remaining four minutes, maybe stretch the class just a teensy bit long and look at one last variation. Uh, for you guys. Yeah, putting in h6 is very important, um, but in the move order in this game, uh, Black delayed doing it until when he knew that he was going to have to uh, sort of take Sorry, when, when he knew that white was going to play e5, here it is very, very important to play the move h6, I believe. Although, actually, maybe you can play d takes e5, but no, yeah, h6, I think, is just a better line. Uh, but with our move order, we always have h6 on the board anyways, so we don't even have to worry about that. MVL just chose a different line. In this case, that transposed. Are we booked up yet? Are we ready to play the bishop g5 line? So not just yet. Not just yet, Great Wolf. I think there is going to be a part two. I am going to analyze just one more variation before we call the class quits here. And then I'm going to do a quick review of what we haven't actually covered yet. Uh, there's not too much left, though, I, I promise. So I mentioned the idea of f5 here. Sorry, um, in this position, I mentioned the idea of f5, the idea of e5. But white does have one more pretty serious try, and that is to take on f6. So let's analyze this very quickly. Uh, bishop takes f6, and to do so, we're going to take notes from uh, a game between Dmitry Kokorev and Peter Leko. So very quickly, let's do this. Uh, takes on f6, g takes f6. Now, bishop e2 is an attempt to sometimes plant this bishop on h5 and take advantage of some weak dark square, weak light squares for black. So h5 is a good multi-purpose move for black to stop the bishop from getting here. Also slow down the king's side pawns white castles, and now it's good to bring the queen back into the game, back to a5. Uh, here, uh, the move king h1 actually makes a lot of sense, because at a later date, black is going to play queen c5, and white wants the queen on this diagonal, but might not necessarily want to trade the queens. So knight c6 instead, knight takes c6, b takes c6, getting developed, queen d4, bishop e7. And now after knight a4, uh, the ideas here for black are basically just to play this move d5, and he's going to solve his problem of the king by playing king f8 and king g7 at a later date that we'll see. So I played through these moves rather quickly, but the benefit here for black is that you get this nice, big, strong center that, while, while it is very compact, it is very uh, solid, very tough to crack, and so I think black should be perfectly safe in this line as well, as we see in this game. Queen d4 was played, bishop b7, knight a4, and yeah, d5 is a good break in general for black here. Knight b6 attacks two pieces at the same time, rook b8 saves the rook. We get a trade, rook b7 at first glance looks very threatening, but now queen c5 uh, evicts this queen. Black, white would not be so happy with this queen trade when black's uh, pawns are actually doing quite well for him. In fact, I think black is still technically up a pawn at the moment. So after queen c5, this was the point of king h1. Now the queen can move back to d3, keeping some attacking ideas alive. But king f8 is a good move now for black. And black can, is ready to step to g7 whenever necessary to get out of danger. The game continued with f5, 
Black, of course, wants to keep this uh, file closed, so e5 is a natural response. And now the players began a great shuffling technique uh, where they all moved back and forth until they agreed that the game should be declared a draw, uh, which happened here. Uh, in some team championship, I think, between uh, Kokorev and Peter Lecko. <clears throat> so instead of a3 or queen d2, what if white does bishop takes f6? So that's what we're looking at right now, Yashis, is bishop takes f6. Um, so those are, I think, the three real main options for white after this move, uh, queen d2, that we see here. Right, so there were two really main ideas, a3 and queen d2. Queen d2 allows you to take on b2, and that's what we looked at here in these past three games. And a3 is what we looked at in the first game between Karyakin and MVL. I think they're both very, very common. Uh, in my database, a3 is played a little bit more often at the higher levels, but uh, definitely both worth knowing. A3, like I said, very linear theory, so you can go pretty deep into the position and get by with an understanding of ideas from there. Queen d2, there are those three main ideas of f5, e5, and bishop takes f6, all of which we looked at very briefly. And then lastly, the stuff that we didn't cover. So here there is one or two more ideas for white. You can play the move queen to d3 here, or you can play the move bishop to takes f6. We're going to take a look at both of those next week. Uh, they're not very serious tries for white, though. White does actually just get worse versions of everything we've looked at here today with these variations, in my opinion. Uh, of course, there are actually some moves for white besides f4. When we think of the bishop g5 Nidorf, we think of this move f4. That's sort of the, the main variation. But we are going to look at some of these other developing moves that white can choose here as well in the next lecture. And that's sort of all that's remaining in bishop g5. And in fact, that's almost all that's remaining in the entire Nidorf series. I'm probably going to do one or two wrap-up lectures where I cover sort of the odds and ends, the bits and pieces that I missed along the way, uh, and as well as some sidelines that, that come out pretty early on. But you guys, if you've been following the series thus far, should be pretty close to having a, a complete understanding of the Nidorf. We are definitely in the home stretch. Uh, thank you guys so much for sticking it out with me on this series. I've had a lot of fun putting all this stuff together, and I can't wait to uh, get to the, the epic conclusions of it. All right. That's it from us here tonight on YouTube. The fun will continue live on Twitch if you guys are still with us, if you're watching the recorded version. Once again, my name is Caleb Denby. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next time.